It's my pleasure to introduce our very own Molly Bentley. Molly will be moderating tonight's event and introducing our esteemed panel. If Molly doesn't look familiar, you will surely recognize her wonderful voice from the acclaimed radio show and podcast, Big Picture Science, where Molly is the executive producer and co-host. And please uh, join me in welcoming Molly. Thank you. Good, good evening. Could, the first question we always have to ask, can you hear me? It's the question we always ask in radio anyway. When it comes to understanding the origin of life, the questions are big and the answers are complex. But luckily tonight, we are joined by scientists who are experts at making complexity accessible. Dave Diemer is a research professor of biomolecular engineering at the University of California, Santa Cruz. And Bruce Damer is an associate researcher in that department. And they are here tonight to discuss their new model for the origin of life. That it began not it, that it began in warm pools on land, not in hydrothermal vents in the ocean. That these warm pools on land are the most plausible site for life's origins. And they will talk about how they're putting their ideas to the test in Western Australia. Their work, which includes that of their colleague Tara Jokic, was on the cover story of your 2017 August subscription of Scientific American. Mine is well thumbed here. Lynn Rothschild is a senior scientist at NASA Ames Research Center. She's an astrobiologist, she's a synthetic biologist, and she will bring her she will provide an evolutionary biologist's perspective on this subject within the framework of NASA's astrobiology program. And we had the pleasure of interviewing Lynn recently for a show that we did on Big Picture Science on extremophiles, and she was terrific. Now we just have two other gentlemen to book on the show about the origins of life, and we'll be all set. So in case you had any questions of whether or not these scientists are um, willing to sweat for the answers to these big questions, consider this. Some of Bruce's field work is in an active geothermal area of New Zealand called Hell's Gate. David's is on a site in Lassen Volcanic National Park called Bumpus Hell. And one of, one of Lynn's projects for creating a novel organism that can endure extreme conditions is called Hell's Cell. So please welcome these three scientists who are willing to endure what they're willing to endure to answer these questions. Please come up on the stage, Lynn and Lynn and Dave and Bruce. So, what I really would like to do is just show you one slide with a, a Hubble image of the galaxy and a bunch of arrows, and say this is where life started. End of story. Thank you very much. And then we could, you know, we could all go out to dinner. But um, it's not quite so simple. And so, what I'd like to do is give you a little bit of a perspective. Um, sort of leading up to the story that you're about to hear. This is sort of an awkward panel. I'm used to being in more of a debate format, but unfortunately, I, I don't feel that I can debate these two gentlemen because I'm actually a great admirer. So that makes it a totally boring evening for you. But so I'm, what I'll do is give you more of an introduction. So before we talk about where life originated, you do have to think a little bit about what is life. And we could spend a lot of time thinking about it. People tend to give definitions of you know, commonalities in life on Earth. I like to think of it in, in maybe a little bit more philosophical point of view, that life is an emergent process. It's based on physical components, but it's not just an object. It would just be like a river isn't a river unless it moves. And this includes fighting entropy, just the way Schrodinger told us in his famous lectures in, I believe it was 1944, that life fights um, entropy. So if you leave a kid's room all neat and tidy and you come back in a month or maybe in a few hours, I finally decided the other day that what you really need is a clip of that scene in Mary Poppins, you know, singing and just run it backwards, and that's entropy for you. And life obviously has to fight entropy or else we wouldn't be here. But of course, we do have some physical components. Life as we know it is not just some sort of ethereal, intellectual thing. It's a physical instantiation. And I believe very firmly that sort of ground zero is that life is based on organic carbon chemistry and that you need a solvent likely water. And I'll go into that in a moment. But you also need energy and you need time. So there are a lot of reasons that I believe that carbon's really important, um, but there are a lot of other elements that we need as well. 
for various aspects of cells, um, at least for life as we know it. But I suspect these that you see here are ones that we would see over and over in life forms anywhere you go. We do happen to use a lot of metals. It's critical to us. Um, people always ask which metals, and I always tell them, look on the back of a vitamin bottle. And so I've provided a vitamin bottle for you. You can run home and, and look again tonight. Water, now there are potentially other solvents besides water. Um, people have thought a lot about liquid ethane or methane, which would then allow us to think about life on Titan. It would be incredibly cool. And there are a lot of people who would like to be sort of perverse about it. But at the end of the day, water looks like it's a really great one. It's very common in the solar system and the universe as a whole. It's got a lot of great properties, including the fact that it's um, less dense when it's frozen, which allows you to have an ice cube in your gin and tonic floating around so you can prepare for summer. Otherwise, it would just sink to the bottom. But in a more serious way, that also allows us to have ice-covered bodies like Europa, this moon of Jupiter, and Enceladus, the moon of Saturn, that has liquid water underneath it rather than being frozen solid. It also, of course, has a lot of great chemical properties, including being liquid at a fairly high temperature. How long does it take for life to originate? People say, oh, it's got to be you know, a long period of time. You need to have a planet that's been stable for long periods of time. What do, how long does it take? We have no idea. I suspect that it's actually very quick once we have the building blocks built up. Whether it you know, was a, a three-day weekend at some point, or a year, <laughs> or 10,000 years, I don't know. But I suspect it wasn't millions of years. If you think about it, we throw out these numbers like millions of years, but as humans, we think in the lifespan of about 100 years. So even a million year, even a 100 year experiment would be um, almost beyond our comprehension. Um, anything more than a three year experiment is beyond the comprehension of the funding agencies. So I suspect that it actually was fairly quick, but we only have one example. We, we wouldn't know. Where did it originate, which is the subject for tonight? We don't really know that either. Was it um, off Earth? Did life originate on Mars, which should have been more um, clement before the Earth? Or were the building blocks produced off Earth and came through meteorites and interplanetary dust particles and so on? Or maybe the whole thing happened on the Earth, maybe in a deep sea vent, in a hydrothermal vent, or in Darwin's warm little pond, or in some other surface area. So that's talking about sort of these, the philosophical picture and then the individual building blocks. But to go from there to an organism, you have to start dealing with polymers. And the big ones for life are lipids, which of course form our membranes. And they can form abiotically and self-assemble. You want to go do it at home, you, you know, take water and vinegar or oil and vinegar and you shake it and you've made your own little vesicles. Proteins, amino acids, are made abiotically, and we can make short peptides abiotically in various ways, including shock synthesis, which just means that if you've got these on a meteorite and they whack into the earth, you can actually help produce smart proteins. Um, you can also um, have bases that are important for the nucleic acids found in abiotic settings, but how do you go from there to nucleotides, and how do you go from there to um, polymers, and I'm sure that Dave's going to talk about it since he's done really the great work in that area. See, I, I, I would have cited your work even if you weren't on stage. Um, DNA is not so easy. I sort of joke that it's not deoxyribonucleic acid. It probably just stands for do not ask. So I think at that point, um, I really would like to turn the stage over to the next speaker. Thank you, Lynn. That said it all. Are there any questions? <laughs> No, it's more than that. I'm going to give you three big points in three slides. They, um, the organizers asked us to limit our talk to three slides, and that's a very good idea. Believe me, Frank, uh, it's an excellent idea because that really focuses our attention of us and of you. So three major things that you'll want to understand if you're going to understand what Bruce is going to say a little bit later. The first one is that there are two kinds of water on the Earth. There's the 99% and the 1%, something like the distribution of wealth, you know. <laughs> the 99% the is in that little inset up to the right, and that's seawater. The ocean is 99% of the water on the Earth. It's salty, 
It's got calcium and magnesium in it. It's hard water. It's a neutral pH, a little bit up around close to pH 8, which is just a bit on the alkaline side. It was probably more acidic the time that life began. But uh, what you see coming out of the floor of the ocean there is a uh, what we call a hydrothermal vent, an alkaline hydrothermal vent. This is a white smoker that was discovered in the uh, 2000 era, maybe 10 or 15 years ago. And this uh, came along after the discovery of black smokers. So isn't it interesting that we have these two kinds of smokers going on down in the floor of the ocean all the time. The black smokers are loaded with uh, uh, metallic minerals and they produce a black deposit that can rise up many uh, tens of meters uh, off the floor of the ocean due to this uprising from hot water heated by magmatic heat, basically heat uh, related to volcanic action going on under the sea floor. This is a little bit different. The white smokers are caused by a chemical reaction called serpentinization. Seawater reacts with certain minerals in the seafloor and it produces a very alkaline effluent. If we put a pH meter into that, it would be up around pH 10. Uh, it's a very alkaline compared to the seawater at pH uh, 8, in fact. So the white is, in fact, minerals, calcium and magnesium minerals, that are carbonates. And uh, this stuff comes up and produces uh, this mineral white smoke that you can see there. Uh, it, when the black smokers were discovered, it was amazing. There was life there. Here we are really deep in the ocean. Takes the Alvin submersible to get down to it, to look around down there. And there was, it was abundant life. So Jack Corliss, who visited us just uh, what, uh, last year, I guess, came by. Jack Corliss was in the submersible. And in 1977, 78, as I recall, he was down there and was among the first people to see it. Uh, John B Ross, then, of the University of Washington, took notice of that. And he got together with Jack and a graduate student, a couple of other people, and they said, maybe life began there. If life is there now, maybe life could be there uh, at the beginning. And uh, other people then took this up as an explanation of the origin of life. And they're still working on this. So they're our colleagues. We see them at meetings. Uh, we invite them to our meetings, in fact, to tell us uh, for what progress they've been made. But we have another idea. I'm a biomolecular engineer by just definition with what I do at uh, UC Santa Cruz. But before that, I'm what's called a biophysicist. And there are, there are things that go on in life that are not chemical, they are physical. And one of these is the self-assembly of membranes. These are the boundaries around every living cell. Nothing tells a membrane how to make itself. It's as spontaneous as the soap bubbles that we've all blown in our life. A soap bubble, if you've never seen one, is truly miraculous. Nothing holds it together except some very weak forces between the lipid-like molecules that form the bubble. The same sort of microscopic bubbles are, in fact, the boundaries of all the trillion cells in every human body in this room. So keep that in mind. Self-assembly is another lesson I want you to take home. Self-assembly does not work very well in seawater. We discovered that 20 years ago and published a paper on it. It startled everybody because you know, everybody said, well, heck, life must have begun in the ocean because there's so much water. There's just a little bit of fresh water, you know, lakes and uh, ice packs and plus stuff like that. But in fact, we said that the calcium and the magnesium in seawater inhibits the formation of membranes. And if you're going to have a cell, you're going to have to have a membrane to keep everything in place. So that is the biophysicist viewpoint. And that got me started on the line of research that finally led to this uh, concept that we're developing now. And that is that life did not begin in the ocean, but freshwater hot springs, such as Bumpus Hell, that uh, is right up here in Mount Lassen. I'll bet some people in this room have visited it. I've been, been to Kamchatka twice. There's another place that we've done work. 
Uh, Bruce has traveled down to New Zealand to another hot spring, and we can make things happen in hot spring environments that simply can't happen in an ocean environment. So what you're going to hear tonight is the next point, and that is self-assembly. Could I have the next slide? Actually, it's not a slide, it's a video. Does this run? Can you get that to run? What you're seeing here is what I see under the microscope. Off to the left is some dried phospholipid. That's the stuff that makes membranes. So it's in all the membranes of every living cell on Earth. It's been dried down in a microscope slide, and I've added water off to the right. The water penetrates into the lipid uh, multilayers. That's actually a multilayered structure in the dried lipid. And as it penetrates, this swells and turns into these long tubules that come out that you're seeing. And the tubules then uh, are not, not stable, and they break up into the membranes that you see falling off uh, that dry lipid. So that is what self-assembly looks like. I was so interested in that that I asked, could self-assembly appear on the early Earth? Was there anything there that could help self-assembly of membranes for the first forms of cellular life happen? Well, we extracted a meteorite. And we're going to hand around a sample of the Murray meteorite that we just extracted a little while ago you're going to smell an aroma that is five billion years old. This is older than the Earth because it was synthesized in the molecular cloud that gave rise to our solar system. And then it was on little tiny particles we call interstellar dust that made the asteroids. The asteroids collide. Pieces of the asteroid come to Earth and form a meteorites, and that's what you're smelling. I put some of that stuff, if I put added water to this, you would see this happening. It forms membranes, five billion years old, and we are easily able to make membranes and get the membranes to encapsulate stuff. And that's the other thing that we have to think about. We're going to make membranes, but how does stuff get caught inside? And that brings us to the last point that I want to make. Next slide. These are membranes of phospholipid with a difference. I have put what we call monomers. And just a quick little explanation. A monomer is something that makes a polymer. If you're a chemist, you know those words uh, uh, very easily. Uh, a monomer, for instance, is an amino acid, and a protein is a polymer. A nucleotide is a monomer of nucleic acids, like DNA and RNA. And the nucleic acids are polymers. So these are the two primary polymers of all life on Earth proteins, and nucleic acids. And we don't know where they came from. That's one of the big gaps in our understanding of the origin of life. Where do they come from? I put this lipid in with the monomers of ribonucleic acid. It's one of our nucleic acids that we use. I put this mixture through a wet-dry cycle such as we see in the volcanoes that are all over the uh, Earth. You know, as I say, I've been to a dozen volcanoes in my time. And everywhere I go, we see rain bringing in precipitation, fresh water, not salt water, and we see evaporation causing these to dry out. And as it dries out, anything in solution becomes very concentrated and begins to react. Those monomers that I put into this system of membranes, see those big red bubbles there, that red stuff is ribonucleic acid. We have made RNA under the conditions of wet-dry cycling in volcanic freshwater pools. And that is the fundamental thing that is different from other origins of life stories. Freshwater, self-assembly, polymerization by wet-dry cycles. Bruce will now tell you about some of the implications from what I've just told you and where this all fits into the evolution of life on Earth. So to get us started off, I'm going to hand out another uh, wonderful artifact. This is show and tell time. Uh, this is kind of ground truth for us. This is a three billion year old 
piece of rock that is basically constructed through the processes of life itself. These ridges on here uh, are something called stromatolite or stromatolytic textures laid down by biofilms, by basically microbial mat for uh, thousands of years or probably, probably tens of years to make this sample at a s steamy, stinky lake shore in the Tumbiana, now what's called the Tumbiana in Western Australia. And we picked this up during a field work about four, three, four years ago. So what you're actually holding as I pass this around is actually our common ancestor, which is microbial uh, biofilms dominant in the fossil record for 90% of, of Earth's history. So uh, if we can start my slides, should I just start them? If I can see, I can't hardly see anything. Is that it there? Sure? Yep. Okay. So this is going to start with some hot, sweaty field work. Now we need the sound up. Okay. There's no sound there. We can get the sound. Uh, this hot, sweaty field work, I can probably even just talk you through it. So this is in New Zealand at the aforementioned Bumpus Hell, where we took uh, vials of reagents, which included dried lipid and the monomers of RNA, where we wet dry cycled the reagents with actual acidic hot spring water at about pH 1.7. And I would basically hydrate these vials, place them into this heat block directly into the hot spring, and wait about 35 minutes uh, for them to dry and then to bake. And in the baking phase, the monomers of RNA are just sort of moving around in between uh, the layers of lipid and forming RNA polymers. Uh, and when we brought the, the samples back uh, from the lab or to the lab, we found a really highly productive, this is a very highly productive system. We had predicted that, well, we would get just a few, uh, a, a few polymers, maybe hardly to see because the natural system is, is so complex. Uh, and, and the natural environment is so sort of molecules might form in a warm little pond. And Dr. Damer believes this to be much closer to the truth. There we if are. we can show to our, our colleagues and to the world that we can self-assemble an important biopolymer of life called RNA in a hot spring pool that's cycling in the conditions that would have been around in the early Earth on these big volcanic islands, our colleagues are really going to seriously look at doing more experiments. And it'll create a whole movement, a whole sort of paradigm shift in origin of life thinking back to Darwin's warm little pond, only now it's a cycling hot little pool. Jaden McLeod, Local Focus. So the, um, the little thing that I was holding at the end there is called a fairy castle. And we, we just drove about half an hour from Hell's Gate to a different hydrothermal system, which was a sandbar where the hot spots have been coming up and been tracked for 50 years, and stromatolites were being produced there in real time. And that fairy castle is basically silica pulled out of solution around basically microbial communities which helped to form the actual structure, and it was growing stromatolites in days to weeks in front of your eyes, uh, which actually look the same as the ones preserved in the ancient hot spring in the Pilbara that Tara Jokic found that's the subject of this article. So you can still see the process happening today that, that when we go back and look as far back as we can get on evidence of, for life on Earth in these hot spring environments and other, uh, in, other uh, aqueous environments, we find microbial mats and they behave the same way back then. So now what we're gonna look at, this is just a peek at some of the product that came from uh, from the Rotorua experiment, and we believe that this fibril, uh, imaged by atomic force mic microscopy by our colleagues in Denmark, is the RNA uh, that Dave was showing in the protocells. So that's the uh, that's at, at a quite great length. Um, according to Tui Hassenkam, that's that's a thousand mer, not a 300 mer or 150 mer or a 50 mer. That's a thousand base units in length. So how does this all work? Well, I'm a computer scientist by training, and how many of you are self-described nerds in the room? 
We, we're at SRI, the birthplace of modern visual computing with Doug Engelbart's group and Bill English and where the mouse was carved out of wood, right? So this is a hallowed ground. And SRI, uh, back in the day in the 1950s, would have been using computers that used punch paper tape or magnetic tape to drive them, where programs are like serial instructions. Well, here's a metaphor from uh, those days of computing for how can you write programs without a programmer? How can you start, uh, boot up life itself uh, from random sequences? So if you were, had a, program, a computer you wanted to program but you weren't allowed to do the programming, you would set up just the conditions for programs to emerge. And those conditions would start out with a taper, paper tape puncher that punched random paper tape instructions, random programs were, that were read into a reader, into a uh, primitive computer. This is one from my collection called an Altair 8800 from the Homebrew Club, which is just met down the road here. Uh, that computer would be, have a source of energy. Uh, it would run these programs through a simple microprocessor, and they would either crash or they would uh, play again. <laughs> and I'll say, for instance, the program that uh, did something lit up one of the diodes on the front of the Altair. No, great, great kind of a function. So over time, what you do is then set up the system to take the programs that lit up diodes, put them back into the puncher, and punch random programs onto the end of them. So you end up with program A, B, A, C, and A, D. And over trillions and quadrillions and zentillion times, you might evolve more programs, which might evolve better computers. I don't know if this one was that much better than an Altair, but um, then we got our, our laptops, and. We kept evolving, and we got um, to our computers in our pockets. And these days, we, we pay engineers uh, a lot of money to do this slightly more efficiently. <laughs> but this is the evolution of software and hardware together. So where do we find this system in nature? Where do we find this system? Well, as Dave was, was uh, indicating, we find it in the polymerizer that is all of that wonderful organics that you're smelling coming around, coming in from not only from the sky, but from meteoritic impacts, from hydrothermal systems in the hot spring, the monomers that build polymers in your polymerizer, which is your paper tape puncher. And the paper tape puncher of, of nature makes some paper tapes called polymers that are initially random. And they go into our simple computer called a warm little cycling pool, uh, set up by this, this gentleman, Charlie Darwin. <laughs> and they're encapsulated in these membranous vesicles and called uh, protocells, which are our little simple programs. And they either pop or they do not. They either survive the cycle of being in the pool to dry back down, uh, to, to be resynthesized again, to go through the paper tape again, or they don't. And this is the evolution of software and hardware together. So let's put this all together on the landscape. We call this the hot spring origin of life. And here's our Hadean landscape, say 4.1 billion years ago. You see the early solar system, there's the sun there, and there's planets sweeping through the the disk of the dusty disk of the uh, sort of protoplanetary disk of the solar system, sweeping all this material up that we know is packed with organic com compounds. Those compounds are, are therefore, a lot of them synthesized in space, like what you're smelling. Uh, they rain down on the Earth and accumulate. They can accumulate in little pools on land, whereas if they land in the bulk of the ocean, they're lost. Uh, for the use in prebiotic chemistry. They're simply diluted. So they can come into a number of pools. So here's a little network of pools that we notice can have different pHs, different temperatures, different concentration abilities, and they can mix across pools. And you can see this in any hot spring you go to. We call it nature's chemistry set. So they really look like and act like a chemistry set. So within those pools, they can get concentrated enough to come together to form more complex structures like membranes and like polymers. So for example, if this collection manages to find itself to a cycling pool that's doing the thing that Dave has shown in, in the laboratory, now we're showing in the field, wet, dry, wet, dry, wet, dry, 
you can do amazing complex chemistry like we were doing in, in Rotorua. And so here's our cycling pool driven by a, a, a geyser that's pushing pulses of water into the pool. And the key thing is it's so regular. You know, like Old Faithful every 73 minutes or whatever it has been in the past. It's so regular. Because if we're setting up in the lab to do almost industrial scale chemistry, to do away from equilibrium chemistry, to, to ratchet a system up, we just do it on a repeated basis. Where do you find that in nature with cycling hydrothermal geyser systems? Also through wet dry cycling in dews in the day, through periodic rainfalls. There's cycles everywhere of wet and dry. So what happens in this system is in, in the dry phase, you get these films that synthesize your polymers. In the wet phase, they're encapsulated, they butt off, and they're encapsulated into trillions of compartments, which is a, each, a, each an experiment in combinatorial chemistry. The ones that survive form these sludges in the bottom of the dish or the pool. And that sludge is a combinatorial unit that we believe is the path to the Carl Woese concept of the progenote, if you've studied his work over the years. The progenote is described as the boot-up phase of life, the unit that, that establishes the relationship between phenotype and genotype over time and allows the living cell to emerge from not individuals competing, but from a network of collaborating protocells. Because in this period of history, there's no way, there's no technology for cells to compete. So they can't evolve strictly with the Darwinian system of linear descent because there's no species. There's no ability to create offspring. So it had to start with a network effect. And this was Carl's intuition in, in this 1977 paper, the same year that Alvin discovered the hydrothermal vents. So we believe that the progenote uh, can emerge in these wet, dry cycling systems. The progenote is an interesting thing. It's basically like bathtub sludge, you know. We came from a very ignoble start, in other words. And, but it has the property of distribution. So these protocellular masses can flow into other pools. They can dry down as films and blow in the wind, akin to seeds or spores. So they can populate a landscape. Why is that important? Because they can get into more than one environment, so the eggs are out of one basket. Why is that important? because they can develop polymeric evolutions in these cycling systems and then share them across the landscape. That's exactly how life works today. You know, the seeds you know, come from trees, they flow into other environments as quickly as possible. And, and basically, ev the products of evolution are shared across a, a giant landscape, including cultural and technological evolution. So just finishing up here, the progenote being the unit of uh, initial evolution becomes the microbial mat community. So the origin of the microbial mat is a simpler form of community made out of protocells. So the cellular community's ancestor is a protocellular community. That's called the principle of continuity that was described by Hans Morowitz. So just moving along toward the, the life that uh, Lynn studies, so we, we would see these protocells uh, form, they would gradually get more function, they get pores, metabolism, they would then learn how to capture sunlight, maybe through delivered uh, pigments in, called polycyclics, and then gradually they would develop more autonomy over time, learn how to divide, we see their early life, the rise of cell division, that's a major challenge, that's a major chasm to cross, so you need a, co a combinatorially massive system to get to cell division. Once they have cell division, then they have linear descent. They have a system of hereditary, heritable traits. Perhaps they've, they've got an active photosynthetic system, some kind of translation for proteins, uh, and they're becoming more robust. And then they can adjust to the salty seashore, the very turbid environments of high tides, and they must develop active membrane transport to deal with the, the salt water. And so then you get back down to these, these things, which one of which you're holding in your hand. So the top is the hot spring stromatolite discovered by Tara and, and, his, and her colleague, Martin Van Kranendonk, at 3.5 billion years. This is lakeshore stromatolite, which you're passing around, fresh water. And this is the marine stromatolites that are common in the fossil record, that are ubiquitous in the fo fossil record, in fact. And, that, that had to adapt to much more extremophile conditions. 
So really, that's, that's our entire story. So we, we hope you followed along with it and managed to hold the stromatolite. And, and a final story for you, the stromatolite that you're passing around has been around the world twice. Uh, it's been to Stevens Bay in the Galapagos where, where Darwin uh, uh, stepped ashore from the Beagle. But the most interesting place it went was Weta Workshop in New Zealand where Sir Richard Taylor, delightedly the founder, one of the three founders of Weta, grabbed it, had it 3D scanned for their collection, and it's in three movies as an Easter egg, and they named it Precious, <laughs> because they made the Lord of the Rings films. So it's called Precious, uh, officially. It's the most famous stromatolite on the planet. And with that... Bruce wants that back. <laughs> So yes, Precious must continue uh, her journey uh, around the planet. So thank you very much. We have a, a, just one uh, small surprise. There are three chairs out there. The down underneath the chair, there's a metal bar, and there's a piece of paper taped to three chairs down there, and that, is, that entitles you to a signed copy of David's new book, just published, Assembling Life, which you can get at the table on your way out. <laughs> <They're all> <laughs> <coughs> That's okay. You should have them. Yeah, no. Yeah, I think we have some winners. Okay, we're going to... Hold up a hand if you want <laughs> Yeah, need. hold up your hand if you have, if you found... Okay, we have one, one two... two. It's one more. One more. And you, and you know, Dave, you can, you can say hi to him afterward. Okay, we're going to, uh, let's get the discussion started because it's going to be brief. We want to include some um, questions from the audience. You know where to go when you have your questions. But let, let me ask, um, uh, I don't say our panelists, they're not really panelists, but the scientists here, some follow-ups. So um, Dave and Bruce, the, the work that you outlined here represents a new theory about where life originated, although it's really an update on an old theory. Of course, it was Darwin himself, who I think in uh, 1871 suggested that it could be a little warm pond. But there is a competing theory about how life got started. There's more than one. Um, but one is that it was a hydrothermal vent. And just a couple months ago, I was down at JPL um, at, at NASA, where they reproduced the conditions of the ancient ocean in their lab, and they successfully created amino acids. And they're feeling like that is a very strong indication that they're on the right track. So I'm wondering, um, what the, is the crucial difference between these two theories? I don't think it's just salt water and fresh water, although that's actually that's part of it. Um, and are you suggesting that your theory replaces the hydrothermal vent theory? Well, the way science works is that <laughs> we have alternative hypotheses, and that's mm -hmm. the best way to do science. That way, nobody's right or wrong. What you're trying to do is to get weight of evidence. You're testing these two hypotheses. Uh, so that's what's happening. We're testing the freshwater hypothesis, but we're fortunate that we can visit places where we think uh, are analogs of the original uh, site of life's beginning on the Earth, right? these freshwater volcanic uh, conditions. It's much harder to go down the Alvin to test it there. So what Lori Barge is doing with Michael That's Russell That's who I spoke is with, um, uh, making a simulation of a hydrothermal vent by putting, uh, injecting a solution that will produce a mineral. And within that mineral, then, they have added one extra compound, which I think is pyruvic acid, I'm not sure, uh, and with ammonia, uh, I'm getting kind of a booming quality. <laughs> is that okay? Okay. Um, uh, um, yeah, with, and the ammonium then adds to the pyruvic acid and makes uh, glycine. Well, glycine was made 1953 by Stanley Miller. 
uh, with, and uh, other amino acids as well, alanine, by sparking a mixture of gases that might have been around on the early Earth. So glycine is sort of a, you know, we've got that in hand. It's in meteorites, it's uh, synthesized, it's out in the outer space. We have radio telescopes looking and seeing an evidence of glycine in outer space. So glycine is a monomer that's been around. The trick is to make it into a polymer. polymer. Let's, let's leave that there because mm -hmm. there's, uh, this is really a discussion that could go on for a while, but that's excellent. So, so we'll leave it at there are competing uh, yeah. hypotheses. There's competing hypotheses. Um, so Lynn, I wonder if you could uh, address the implications of this new theory or hypothesis um, that, and how it bears on the search for life elsewhere in the universe. For example, if life did begin in saltwater vents, as suggested by uh, hydrothermal vent theory, um, you're unlikely to find it on Mars, for example. So what is your reaction um, to, to this proposal that life started in these freshwater pools? What does that, how does that bear on the bigger question? Well, first of all, I, th I think there have been suggestions that there could be hydrothermal activity on, oh, beneath the surface of Mars, anyway. Um, I mean, that, that there could have been. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. OK. Um, so obviously, if you, well, first of all, you have to understand that conditions for the origin of life are not necessarily completely the same as the conditions for survival for life. So for example, we've got a great planet for humans right now. It's about 20, 21% oxygen in this room and so on. But it'd be much more difficult for some of the prebiotic chemistry to occur in these conditions that are actually perfect for us, and vice versa. I dare any of you to go to back to an anaerobic Earth and, <laughs> and survive. It'd be very There might be a little less nasty. oxygen in yeah, the right, room right, right now, though, than there was when we started. Um, and so, you know, you have to, when you're looking for life, you have to sort of have this time disjunct to where might it originate. So beyond that, um, you know, clearly the implication is that you would want to find places that would have hydrothermal activity or you would want something where there's surface water. Now, once you're starting to deal with surface, though, you have an extra complication, which I don't think Dave or, or Bruce mentioned, and that is that you then have radiation flux on the surface. And that's sort of a mixed thing because ultraviolet radiation can create compounds, but it can also destroy. And so you have this sort of yin-yang balance. And so if you've got a, a body that is absolutely bathed with a high level of radiation, for example, uh, someplace like Mercury that's close to the sun, or a moon that's very close to a planet, very close to Jupiter, and is just getting you know, bombarded with radiation, then surface conditions may not be the best place. So it, it does sort of provide extra implications in there where we might look for places that had the origin of life. But as I said, the conditions of the origin of life are not always the same as the conditions for the survival. So there could even be a multi-planetary thing, as I was hinting, that you could have life originate on one planet and then go to another, or there's a temporal aspect where it originates when the conditions are different and then um, they change to go through some sort of evolutionary cycle or maybe these are separated spatially. So maybe you get the origin of life deep in a hydrothermal vent, just the wrong thing to say soon between the two of them. <laughs> <laughs> and then it moves out into land or, you know, or vice versa. Could you also have uh, life originate um, twice on Earth in, in separate locations? Oh, absolutely. And that's actually something that I was going to ask Dave, because a geyser is, in essence, a hydrothermal vent mm -hmm. by the surface. Mm -hmm. And so it's not clear to me, since you're talking about splash zones for geysers, why the two hypotheses actually couldn't be merged, that you do get some production within a geyser, for example, and perhaps then the polymerization occurs in the splash zone. What Bruce and I like about geysers what Bruce and I like about powerful words. <laughs> right. What Bruce and I like about geysers is that it is a short-term cycling. Mm -hmm. And I visited the, the original geyser in Iceland. And that thing comes up every hour or so, and, and kids get under the plume because the hot water is cool by the time it comes down. So I saw my little daughter get good and wet, you know, while this came down on her. But the thing is it hits hot rock, and that is a wet-dry cycle. So anything that came up that geyser water 
turns into an organic film on the mineral surfaces, and that's where we see the reactions occurring that I, I talked to you about. So if you just stick to hydrothermal, yes, uh, geysers are a hydrothermal thing. It's fresh water, though, much more dilute than seawater. Uh, the problem with seawater is that you cannot have a cycle deep in the ocean, obviously. There's no way to get a wet-dry cycle. And that makes a thermodynamic hurdle that the people promoting uh, a origin of light down there, they have to find a way to get around that. You and I get around it by making activated monomers, and that helps us make our polymers in an aqueous environment. Uh, we don't know how to make activated monomers. And of course, Darwin himself mentioned that was the problem with the warm little pond is that you have a dilution problem that it, you, know, you would have to create so much buildup of organic material if you are um, amortizing over the, the whole mm -hmm. ocean. Um, Let me get okay. a question. But I do want to ask this one is, one No, this is, it's fantastic. There's so much. So Bruce, um, a key idea that underpins all this work that is maybe both obvious and, and a little bit elusive um, was laid out in the 1920s by scientists um, Operin and Haldine that the early Earth was not the way that it is today. And that the chemistry was different, was probably different, and that chemistry could have occurred then that just doesn't occur now. So the question is, um, do we understand what the conditions were of the early Earth in the scenario that you've, you've put forth here? And how do you recreate a lab experiment if you don't know what the original conditions were? I think the, uh, we, this is why Dave and I went to Western Australia with <laughs> Martin Van Cranendonk and Tara, who we mentioned before, and mm -hmm. Malcolm Walter, because we, and Glenn, you were there. Mm -hmm. So uh, we basically took a truck-like bus contraption from Shark Bay, which uh, we were shown, uh, you were showing on the screen, which has living stromatolites. You can push your, your fingers into the spongy mm -hmm. sort of living surface of them. And we went to the Pilbara, where we could touch the stromatolites at the age of 3.48 billion years, as far back as we've got well-preserved Earth's crust. Now, the interesting thing is, literally, we, we can't look back much further, because you don't have much surviving crust. Everything's sort of reworked. You have something in Greenland at about 3.7 billion years, but it's very metamorphosed. So as far back as we can look, the conditions uh, for those living communities seem pretty much the same as, say, an extremophile environment on Earth now. They, use, they leave the same stromatolytic uh, textures. They're obviously, uh, there's, they're photosynthesizing cyanobacteria, you know, they're colonies, uh, they're, they're microbial mats. So that's all we know. But if you consider planetary formation, we ask the geologists, we ask them, well, how much land mass was there? They said it wasn't granitic sort of tectonic plate landmass, but there would have been a lot of volcanic landmasses. So the analogs being Kamchatka and places like, like, like the North Island of New Zealand or, or like Iceland would have existed there. We would have had cycling systems. We would have rainfall. We would have had climate. So we would have had geysers. We would have had, just as we would have had uh, hydrothermal vents in the ocean, we have hydrothermal systems on land. In fact, the whole Earth was a gigantic hydrothermal cycling system at that time. So we can only conjecture and guess, but we think that by going to the analogs uh, and doing the chemistry and getting the chemistry to work, it's, it's strongly plausible that this could be happening on an, Idean, on an island during the Hadean epoch. So that stromatolite, where is that stromatolite now? Don't walk away with it. <laughs> we can watch that back. So some of the, the answers to the question I just asked you um, are in that, that rock right there. In that they're, in the, they're in the, yeah. what's called the rock record. Yeah, I just have to be able yeah. to encode it. Now the key, um, there are many keys to this. You talked about the, the cycling of hydration and, um, and drying out that goes. Um, but also it's the building of these, of these polymers. And um, we sh polymer, just to define terms here, a polymer defines a structure, not the substance. So the polymer is something that is a complicated molecule, right? It, but it can be of many different things. So you can have one of DNA or you could have one of proteins. And that's what you're looking at. That's what's key about this um, hypothesis here, is that it's a way to, to create 
these building blocks of life. It's not life itself, as you said, that's another jump, but it's to create these precursor molecules. Is that right? And what is it about this, um, and you can just emphasize again, about this, this cycling of drying out and wetting and drying out that provides the necessary stresses so that those molecules come together? Okay, that's probably me, <laughs> the chemist here. Okay. Every chemical reaction, if it's going to happen, has to have what we call Gibbs free energy. It's uphill energetically, and energy is given off as it goes downhill to equilibrium. So when we have polymers made from monomers, the reaction that makes the polymer is what we call a condensation reaction. And we call it that because we're pulling water, the water molecule, out from between the two monomers to make a linkage between the two monomers. So that, that's what we call the dimer. And that linkage, there's only two primary linkages. One is called an ester bond. And everybody in this room has smelled an ester bond because you've opened a bottle of nail polish or polish remover. That is ethyl acetate. That's ethanol attached to acetic acid through an ester bond. So did the early earth smell a little bit like nail polish? No, it smelled like that <laughs> meteorite. <laughs> Stop. Yeah. But, but the, you see, the point being that this is a very simple bond to form. So that RNA that I showed you up there, it's held together by ester bonds. And the reason we have to dry it out is to pull water away from it. That's the energy we're putting into it. We're heating it up a little bit. We're also drying it out. And that means that these molecules that are floating around, instead of just floating around, when they hit, they can lose the water and the water goes away and they stay linked. So that's really what polymerization is all about. Mm -hmm. I want to ask a question just of, um, of Lynn and Bruce and then invite you to come up and, and ask questions of your own. Don't be shy about that. Looks like you're a little shy about that, but <laughs> come on up. Um, so so our, it looks like RNA is, it, you said you created RNA, and I want to ask Lynn, is that, um, what is it that, what is the advantage of RNA as, a, as an early molecule? I mean, why not just go right to DNA and save us a little <laughs> bit of trouble? What is it about RNA that makes well, it so appealing? I mean, as I think was mentioned earlier, um, as organisms, we need two things. We need the physical body, the phenotype, but we need code. We need some kind of genetic material to run the whole thing, you know, and give the instructions. And the beauty of RNA is it's one-stop shopping. Um, it was discovered quite a while ago, actually, one of the professors I had as an undergraduate was, uh, got part of the Nobel Prize for this, that RNA can actually have catalytic activity. So in other words, it can function like an enzyme, which we thought up to then all enzymes were made of proteins. But it also can carry genetic information. Now, why not DNA first? DNA is much more stable than RNA. Um, and so it makes much more sense, but the way we make it in our cells and the way we think it would have been made uh, prebiotically is that RNA is the precursor. Now, what's not been said is actually I'm very bullish on the role of proteins in the origin of life. And we sort of danced around the fact that there are amino acids there. They're actually easier to make prebiotically. But they're and also polymers. Well, okay, let me, let me step back for a second and try to give an analogy for what Dave put okay. so beautifully in case there's one person in the room who doesn't quite get it. A monomer would be like a bead and a polymer would be like a string of beads. So what he was talking about is when you start adding beads, you give off water. And so just think of it that way. How do you go, I was trying to describe some of how you would get these beads and then where Dave and Bruce have had these great insights is how to start to string those beads together and encapsulate those into the start of a body. Is that fair? Yeah. yeah. Okay, one other question. It's kind of a big one, though, but so I'll throw it to Bruce. Um, so is the idea here that you're trying to replicate how life could have started, or are you trying to give us an answer how it did start? So if we created an analogy... Um, uh, like if you had a crime scene, you could have a detective go and give you some theories for what happened. But that's quite different from saying this is what did happen. And which one are you going for? Uh, you put your finger on it. <laughs> the subtitle of my book 
is <laughs> not how did life begin, but how can, can life, life begin. begin. And that's a very important difference in that verb, right? Because we don't know, we'll never know how life did begin because four billion years ago, all this stuff was going on. But we will know how life can begin if we can reproduce those processes in the laboratory or being enlightened by the results, go out into New Zealand and make something happen there that looks like it's a step toward life. Matt, so it's how can life... Even if that's not how life began here, it's possible that whatever you're doing is how life began somewhere else. Mm -hmm, yeah. And there's a, a wonderful project that we're initiating actually with Google uh, called the Genesis Engine. And it was came out of my PhD work about Goodness. more than a decade ago. And the idea is to use the power of Google's basically AI system, to stand up a rapid simulator in software to try to penetrate through the darkness of, of this question. And so what they're actually doing, and we're writing the code right now, is to simulate this polymer formation breakdown uh, evolution system in software and then basically look, drive it as hard as we can in, in the Genesis engine and look for the emergence of functions that we, it's hard to see in the chemistry right now because chemistry takes so much time to do and you, you have to have the right parameters. But the Google Genesis engine could see, oh, a pore just formed in our artificial protocell. And the pore being there has let monomers into the protocell during drying down, which has now set up a catalytic activity, which is now generating and amplifying another <laughs> simulated polymer in the system. And watch this thing happening in silico and then go back to the lab and to the field and say, maybe a pore will emerge next if we do it with the right parameters. So we can use computing, this is my field, and chemistry together, and eventually we'll build the Genesis engine, which will literally run a robotic chemist off to the side with trillions of little, little vials, maybe in microfluidics, that will run the simulation run the actual chemistry, do high performance screening, come back to the simulation, run that, run back this way, and we can penetrate and, and do a kind of an abiogenesis in silico and in vitro. And it still only answers the question how life can begin. We're getting closer. Well, it looks like we have our own, I don't know if you'd call it a monomer or a polymer of... <laughs> <laughs> no. it's, it's pretty Hold short, so we'll say it's a monomer. Yeah. All right. <laughs> no, we, we call that an oligomer. Please begin with your oligomers. Yeah. So I like that Genesis engine. I think I saw that Star Trek movie. Though. <laughs> um, so this, this question is for the two of you. Uh, <clears throat> let's say, for the sake of argument, that your theory is correct, and furthermore, that the only way life can emerge is in these pool scenarios and not in hydrothermal vents, just for the sake of argument then are the various um, moons with uh, oceans under ice sterile or doomed to be sterile? Uh, is there some way that life could have emerged with your model in those scenarios? And also, could it have emerged in pre-greenhouse um, pre, uh, Venus and Mars? So this gets to the implications for searching for life elsewhere. Yeah, this is the SETI no. Institute, so I figured I would you know, ask that kind of a question. It's <laughs> an excellent question. I've written a paper exactly on that question. Uh, it has to do with Enceladus. Enceladus is a moon of Saturn. It's only 300 miles in diameter. It has an ice-coated surface, but beneath the ice, it looks like there's a liquid ocean. When the Cassini mission flew past Enceladus, they saw plumes of what looks like vapor coming out of the South Pole. And the idea at the time, the first thing you think of is that this is liquid water being exposed to the vacuum of outer space, and maybe there's stuff in that plume that we'll be able to collect and see whether or not there is life somehow developing on Celadus. Now, in my paper, however, I, I explored these two hypotheses that we've been talking about. And I said, if it turns out that uh, a freshwater hydrothermal volcanic origin is correct, then Enceladus might be habitable, but lifeless, okay? Because life cannot begin unless we have these uh, cycles. On the other hand, if Mike Russell and Laurie and Nick Lane and uh, 
Bill Martin are right and life can begin at Vince, then the Enceladus plumes might be generated by serpentinization occurring in the rocky interior. And this is sort of hot water coming up and we might expect to see some evidence of life in the plume when we fly a mission to it again. So uh, you know, it's just opinion, a plausibility. My opinion is that probably life could not develop on Enceladus, but it might be delivered to Enceladus and just found a way to get the energy and nutrients to live there. Thank you. And indeed, it does have um, implicate. It has bearing on what what missions NASA decides to fly. Um, yeah. So the question. So the research here on on Earth has bearing on where we go in space. Yes. So the question is, could you have life appearing through one of these mechanisms and then failing, appearing again, failing again? One of them begins to really succeed. The next one, you get another start, but it gets wiped out because the mm -hmm. first one succeeded. Yeah. Could you talk about that? Yeah. that that's something that, uh, as a combinatorial person, I thought about a lot that, in fact... Did everyone hear the question? Can, can yes. li no. Would life start and then fail, and then start and then fail, and then start and then fail? And it's just an intuition, but when I sort of visualize these landscapes with the fairly rapid start to, to protocells which are able to do some kind of adaptation, not divide, they're not living cells, the, the fact that they can distribute widely across the landscape in our model means you can have multiple starts and failures. Because a pool, a cycling pool, may have a stable system for years to decades, but it might dry up tomorrow. So I, my, my just intuitive uh, strike on this is that in order for a combinatorial system uh, that to generate complexity as massive as the first dividing cells, when you think about the minimum cell, you need that kind of multiple start and failure. You need a huge pinprick system of f starts and failures, and you have to have the opportunity to fail many times and then to share innovations many times, to cross the enormous thermodynamic sort of combinatorial barrier toward life. You, you just need to have it. So you have to have a landscape that can support massive failure and, and mixing. I'll mention that Norm Sleep here at Stanford and Harold Morowitz had a paper come out 10, 15 years ago, 15, 20 years ago, called Impact Frustration of the Origin of Life. And this is a serious paper because the Earth was being hit by gigantic asteroid-sized objects that we see the record of on the moon. And some of those could have been so big that they literally sterilized the Earth's surface. Uh, and therefore, the hydrothermal life that was hiding deep in those hydrothermal vents might have been the survivors of this. But uh, again, maybe not. So that was a serious question and is still an open question. It doesn't, doesn't it also get to the, the time scales involved, that you have a lot of time to fail and start over mm -hmm. and fail and start over again? I know that Lynn has talked about this in, in other talks. Right, and um, actually, as to say, there, there was a later paper by um, Steve Moises at Colorado, and I know because as a reviewer, um, saying that the Earth never actually would have been sterilized during that period. But I was trying to think, uh, the last question, an analogy would be sort of like, you've got a, a garage full of parts and you're trying to put together a bicycle and you know, you get, by, by luck you get maybe a wheel and a handlebar and you know, gee, it doesn't really work with the seat on the ground, so we'll take parts of it about apart, but we could still reuse some parts and so on. And I suspect there was a lot of that going on in the origin of life. You know, bits were reused um, because there really wasn't a concept of self versus other. You know, there was much more sharing of, of whatever molecules there were. And I don't mean to make it sound like it was this golden age, but um, <laughs> I actually call it the orgy stage for my students. But, uh, <laughs> take it. but also you had 100 million years to make that bicycle. So or, <laughs> there was some room or, for Or error. a three-day weekend, whichever. <laughs> or a three-day weekend. Comes first. One or the other. Okay, yes. A little technical. If you look at um, nucleic acids, including RNA monomer, they're aromatic heterocycles, lots of nitrogen in there. These are very complicated electronic structures, and they act as catalysts. Now, it seems to me that 
the origin of life and the origin of evolution are going to be pretty much the same thing. And that it's not going to be proteins, it's going to be things that are able to act as catalysts and also sort of act as genetic material. So what's your opinion of the theories that involve polymeric heterocyclic aromatic compounds? May I just request that you, um, if you did not hear that, if you could just um, summarize it. And also, we want to be slightly brief. I, we want to get to the end of our, yeah. of our chain here because we have a representative from the future generation who's going to answer all these questions for us someday. <laughs> okay. And we want to make sure that we that. get to him. Okay, okay. So go ahead, please. So I you. got the message. Be brief, if possible, okay? <laughs> so your question has to do with complex heterocyclics like adenine, just for example, yeah. the, one of the four bases of DNA and RNA, okay? And where did it come from, and how did it get caught up in these reactions leading to the polymers I'm talking about? Mm -hmm. There's a big gap in our understanding how to get from adenine to adenosine monophosphate, which is the nucleotide actual monomer of RNA. And we don't know how that happened yet. There's some guesses. Dick Zare, right here at Stanford again, has made some of those reactions occur, but we really don't know yet. Adenine, though, is easy. Five cyanides, five HCMs, this was discovered way back in 1960 by John Rowe, five cyanides can polymerize, you get an adenine. When we analyze the carbonaceous meteorites, we see adenine there, we see guanine, we see a few other nucleobases. So the bases themselves are easy uh, in chemically sense, but getting those bases into a polymer, that's hard. We don't know how to do that yet. Right, thank you. So your time scale of 10 to 100 million years for this process suggests that since in the early days these life forms won't have invented carnivorism or competition even, um, that multiple uh, biogenesis could have occurred at the same time on the planet because they wouldn't spread around. Now we have a million branches of the tree of life, but we believe there's only one root. Is that correct? Or might there be more than one root? So the question of whether or not there's more than one root to the tree of life. There probably was more than one root, but what happened was um, since w all life, as far as we know it on Earth today, comes from a common ancestor, what is much more likely is it went through a bottles, bottleneck, and, you know, one of the better words, sort of a Noah's Ark, so that um, only a few things, one or a few things, um, were able to make it through this bottleneck, and they're the ones that all life on Earth is now descended from. But I do believe that there were lots of experiments. The idea that there was only one way to, to originate life, I find very unlikely. So, th so just the organism that went through the bottleneck is not necessarily the one that was the first organism at all. That's unlikely. Speaking of that first organism, do you think that any of the forms of life we can currently observe, and some of them are pretty weird, like prions, are they even life, right? Uh, do you think that we have some idea of what that original cell would look like compared to the simplest forms of life we see today? Would it be a lot more simpler or would it be more complicated? I'm laughing because I have a new grad student who's actually working on prions and how they might be related to the origin of life. So invite me back in about three years and we'll, <laughs> we'll have some good data for you. I'll be here. What, I mean, what, what is interesting, and I will spill the beans a little bit, is that... Um, Prions have been known as, as infectious protein agents, um, as disease-causing agents in mammals. But they've since been discovered in yeast cells, and um, we're f in archaea, and we're, we've got an awful lot of candidates among the bacteria. So it's something that probably is very ancient, and it does have some information and so on in it. And again, there, there's no scenario I can think of that you wouldn't also make um, amino acids and peptides. So I just absolutely believe that they are the missing piece to the story. Hmm. I understand that uh, NASA has an active mission to go to Europa to put a lander and actually sample the ice for salinity. Uh, and so, you know, rock in, in contact with water. Do you think that that's fundamentally going in the wrong direction or is there a misunderstanding by me about what that mission is trying to accomplish. You're asking me? <laughs> no, well, okay, I'm not speaking on behalf I think of you NASA need to, tonight. You do need to repeat that. That's about the active okay, mission about, to Europa, um, to sample the, sample yeah, the water. Looking, looking for life um, in Europa. Um, I'm not here representing NASA tonight. <laughs> Where, would you, where's the microphone? <laughs> they don't know I'm here. <laughs> um, 
so this is my own you know, opinion. But um, years ago, actually, I had another student from Stanford for his uh, master's thesis. We looked a bit about different chemical uh, continua to see which ones would be most, um, create the most stable uh, situation for DNA. And actually, you do need a salinity that's not unlike the ocean today. And in fact, that's encapsulated in the cytoplasm of every cell. And so that's what mm -hmm. I find, you know, one of the disturbing parts about your theory. Why would all cells on Earth have a salinity that roughly matches that of the ocean if they began in fresh water rather than in the ocean? They don't. OK, we're going to leave that there. <laughs> we have to leave that there. OK. The ocean is. Uh, 600 millimolar salt, sodium, and chloride, 10 millimolar calcium, 55, 53 millimolar magnesium. Those are some of the major cations, okay? Your cells have one, one fourth of that amount of sodium chloride. They're 150 millimolar instead of 600 millimolar. The calcium in your cells is nanomolar. Calcium is a signal in the cells. Your magnesium about five millimolar. So the, it's a misnomer to think that our cells reflect the ocean. We do have the same ions, but at much lower concentrations. But higher than fresh water. Higher, yes. So, higher than so fresh maybe water. maybe what we're we're converging on is a brackish water. Yeah, that's right. That's right. That's <laughs> right. Where where in the world or not on, in the world uh, was life most likely to form? Well, <laughs> uh, well, we can, let, let's take the question to Mars, which is kind of an interesting thing. So when we fly our missions above Mars, Mars is a, a really interesting place because it's like, a, it's like a mummy. It's like preserved for billions of years. When you look down on the surface of Mars, because it lost its water so early on that, that water wasn't there to degrade and weather the system. So you're looking at a truly ancient world. But all over Mars, we find these evidence of there was a shallow ocean in the northern latitudes. And uh, opaline silica sort of pouring down the sides of volcanoes, these, these silicate minerals. And the Spirit rover actually found silica by dragging a bum wheel that wasn't turning anymore through the soil. And it turned up to stuff that looked like snow. You remember that? but it was actually evidence of an old hot spring. So in the last three years, we've been part of the Mars 2020 landing site meetings. And the question they had was, where could life start on Mars and where should we go and look for the new rover that's, that's landing? And we made the argument that where the rover turned up that white soil, all the rocks around there is an old Yellowstone, old, old hot spring. So if we actually went back to a place like that, broke the rocks, we might find those textures of the rock that you just held if we really got lucky, if, if life could emerge in a hot spring environment. And then as Mars died at the surface, as it lost habitability and the water disappeared, the life would escape down the plumbing into the hot, wet rocks down below where it would be quite salty. And that's where you'd find life on Mars, down on those rocks. You know why he doesn't answer your question? <laughs> you notice he completely evaded you. Well, I, I was gonna... Uh, and that's because we have a problem of plate tectonics. So anywhere we pick on the Earth today was not in that location four billion years ago. Is it, is it more likely that, I mean, I'm pretty sure it is, but is it more likely that life appeared first outside of our solar system? Ah, this is, a, this is a very intriguing theory. And then the idea is that it was seeded the life came to Earth. Is that the theory that you're thinking about? I guess what I'm trying to say is, since Earth, we haven't really found a planet yet that has human-like uh, life. There's one. <laughs> <laughs> but so far as, as we know, so is it more likely that since the universe is so big that there, a life originated outside of what we know. And then came here, or that there are multiple, multiple life forms elsewhere? Life forms. Ah, okay, multiple. Okay, I Lynn and I were at a As it conference. turns out. <laughs> yeah, just last week, we were at a conference approaching that question. And there are serious scientists now saying that it's quite possible that life began on Mars, and we are all Martians. 
<laughs> and we're so going to have to put another solar system. I'm afraid we have to leave it there yeah. because we are running out of time. Okay. I believe, thank right? you. I'm getting, the, I'm getting the, thank you very much. You, oh, I hate to leave. Can you just ask one question quickly, please? Thank yeah. you for your question. Very quickly, I'm very curious about the organics, the original organics of uh, starting life. And if there is anything that would have been missing from that set of organics that started life, uh, what would be like possible uh, that would have still could have started life? Right. Uh, and what was brought uh, that made life happen on Earth? And if something like that could happen somewhere else, or can we start life from those original organics? I'm going to, Thank you. I'm going to suggest that maybe that question, because I don't know if that could be answered in, the, in a sentence or two, that would, perhaps we take it outside and you can answer the, the question in the hall. But thank you for that excellent question. So I, wanna, I just want to thank the audience for coming out can tonight. I, can I just say one thing before you close? Yes. And that is our esteemed colleague, Dave Beamer, has a big birthday coming up next week. Oh, and I debated yeah. whether to lead the audience in singing, but instead I'm just going to oh. wish you a very, very <laughs> happy birthday. <laughs> as <laughs> um, very nice. Actually, I'm a big believer in singing. So, ready? <laughs> happy birthday oh, no. to you. Uh, happy is birthday to you. To you. Happy birthday, dear Dave. Sure. Don't call him David. Happy, Happy birthday, birthday to you. Thank you very much. Okay, and the final, the final thought is, is that if Bruce and Dave are correct, then life began on land and crawled into the sea, not the other way around. That's right. Okay, <laughs> to be continued. Ellipses, dot, dot, dot. Thanks, everyone. I could not do that. I could not do that.